Good afternoon. Uh, welcome uh, to, I think we're episode nine of uh, Digital Transformation Thursdays. Uh, we're very excited uh, for today's uh, uh, session. Uh, we'll be, today we'll be discussing uh, data privacy, which is a, a very interesting topic and actually uh, is a source of, I guess, a lot of uh, anxiety uh, among, our, among a lot of people. Uh, it's been uh, enforced for some time now, a couple of years. The law was enacted in uh, 2012, but uh, uh, was only um, went into effect uh, a couple of years ago, uh, three years ago. And uh, we're very pleased to have uh, as our guest, uh, one of the, uh, I guess I would call him uh, the inaugural, or one of the first uh, deputy commissioners of the National Privacy Commission, Don Dimapa. And, uh, I, I'm trying, I was trying to remember uh, this morning uh, when I met Don Dee. So I've, I've known him for many years now. Uh, he, has, uh, he has been working in the IT industry for some time, uh, for a long time. And then uh, at some point he joined the government uh, with the, I, I believe it was the commission on ICT. Uh, and then uh, moved on uh, to uh, back to private sector. And then when the opportunity came up, he uh, joined government again to become uh, the first deputy commissioner uh, for national for the National Privacy Commission. He is currently the chief privacy officer for Asia Pacific at City, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we are very uh, very happy that he agreed to to speak today. In fact, this session was originally supposed to be a session with two speakers, but because of the the, the amount of content that uh, Dondi wants to share, uh, we decided to split the session between him. And uh, Kamesh Ganeson. Kamesh Ganeson will have uh, will be talking about information security uh, on August 27. That's two weeks from now. But today we will focus mainly on DPO, uh, data protection officer issues, running a, a, a regional DPO, getting a glimpse of that. And I believe Don Lee is the the best person uh, to do that. Uh, he's a graduate of the Ateneo de Manila. Uh, and also has a, um, a completed the strategic information management program uh, at the International Development Research Center. Uh, he also uh, received uh, or took an executive education course at the University of Virginia Darden School of Business, as well as in SIAD uh, in Europe. Uh, he was a commissioner uh, of the Commission on Information and Technology uh, Communications Technology (CICT), which is a precursor of the Department of Information and Communications Technology. Uh, he was for a time after uh, leaving government uh, Microsoft's National Technology Office. Uh, in 2016, he joined uh, one of the first uh, three uh, persons appointed to the National uh, uh, Privacy Commission. He was a deputy commissioner from 2016 to 2017. He has since joined the private sector, has been a very uh, a big advocate of training in the, uh, 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 data privacy. He is, uh, he is um, a um, Asia advisory member of the International Association of Privacy Professionals, the IAPP. Uh, as I mentioned also, he's the regional privacy officer of Citigroup Asia Pacific. Uh, and he is also a certified information privacy manager by the IAPP, as well as a certified data protection officer of two of Rhineland. Uh, I'd like you to welcome uh, Adon Dimapa. Hey, Don Di. Hey, JJ, good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon. Yes. Uh, uh, you so know, I, the the next time I introduce you, I, I have to add drummer. I didn't know you were a drummer. Oh, uh, yeah, try, <laughs> trying to be. <laughs> so I wonder now if, uh, are you seeing the poll results? Uh, I'm seeing that, it, yeah. yeah. Okay, there you go. So these are your questions. Uh, let's see. So it looks like uh, you've got a lot of lawyers uh, and uh, half are uh, neither DPO and COP. Um, but I'd like to, quarter, yeah. yeah, I'd like to convince them to be to take up uh, privacy as a profession. So maybe those fifty-two percent, at some point, you know, will join us. Right, right. And then, but there's a there's a quarter who don't even know what the DPO and the COP is. So that's that should be interesting. Um, primary background: I've got a lot of lawyers, and then uh, some IT, uh, about fifteen percent, thirteen percent IT, uh, IT. Uh, inf information security professionals, about 4% and 42% are others. Okay. And yeah. then uh, it looks yeah, like it's yeah. a nice split no? of uh, yeah. SMEs. Yeah. JJ, why don't you address this right there? You know, there's a comment, Mekulung. 
Uh, may kulong daw ang DPO C C COP. So, why don't you address <laughs> that? I'll let you do that. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, so put me on the spot. Huh? So, one of the one of the main concerns of course is that the national sorry, the Data Privacy Act does have uh, uh, penal provisions. And of course, this means that uh, if there's a violation of the law, uh, the, there's a chance that the data protection officer will uh, will go to jail. But uh, I believe uh, even back when uh, uh, Dondi was with the National Privacy Commission, the commission has been very clear that they will not initiate criminal proceedings unless they feel that there is a uh, uh, a first, I guess, a, a large harm. But I think more importantly that the that the NTP or the data protection officer really uh, shows. Uh, sort of no intention to really protecting uh, privacy rights. So the criminal liability is there, but I think it's more of a stick that uh, the NPC wields. But uh, I think to date they uh, they've only um, they've only wielded it once, which is uh, with respect to Comelik. And, and of course, I think Comelik uh, at the time that it happened uh, set a world record. It was the largest uh, uh, data breach uh, in the world. I think uh, millions of Filipinos were affected by Comelik. And it so, was not the, it was not the DPO that was that was charged. It was the head of the organization, no? the head of the agency. Right, right. Is, uh, yeah. Okay, so let's. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So let's uh, Let's see. Um, so the the last is uh, mukhang, uh Wow, uh, we've got from about fifty percent are from uh, eleven employees to a thousand employees. That's a big spread, and then. You've got a lot of people here. About uh, about uh, thirty six percent of the audience are from large companies. So this is very interesting. Wow. Yeah. Uh, maybe we're seeing uh, big groups, uh, you know, uh, um, wanting to learn more about data privacy. So there is a Q and A part. Feel free to post your questions. Uh, you would you, you will get more attention for your question if you put it in the Q and A rather than on the chat. Uh, I just want to mention to you, Dondi, that uh, there are. Uh, we do have uh, attendees. Uh, I don't know. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, you'll be. I don't know if you'll be surprised, but uh, mm -hmm. we have somebody. We have people here from. Um, uh, we have someone from Japan. Uh, somebody's oh, logging in from, from Italy. Uh, uh, buongiorno. Uh, we, yes, we've got uh, we've got people all over uh, all over the Philippines, uh, Quezon City, uh, Bicol. Uh, and I'll, I'll we'll get to that a bit more later when I've been able to. <laughs> I know, but uh, you've been able to. So we got 500 on the. I'm trying to figure out how many on uh, on FB Live. Uh, I'll, uh, oh, so we got we've got about 500, 600 uh, people uh, watching us right now. So uh, congrats on, uh, on a successful uh, no, successful uh, attendance. So I think I'll I'll stop here and uh, let you proceed with your presentation. Thanks, Tony. Well, first of all, JJ, you no, know, thank you for inviting me. Uh, yeah, when we first met, that's already been lost in the shrouds of time. I can't even recall <laughs> either. Okay, but yeah, definitely, you know, JJ and I uh, have uh, become uh, close uh, associates, you no, know, and acquaintances again, uh, primarily because of this uh, area of data privacy, you no. Know? And so I'm glad he invited me to talk about uh, data governance, you no, know, privacy and security, because. Uh, for me, it's really a, a very interesting career path. And in fact, uh, at the NPC, when I was the former Deputy Privacy Commissioner, we had a goal, no, which was to make the Philippines a center of excellence. Now, we felt that Filipinos would really have a chance to shine in this profession and even be able to take uh, positions around the world. No? And I guess that I would already be an example of that, uh, holding a regional post no, for, for a a major multinational bank. Uh, I'd like to begin my uh, presentation, you know, with this article. I think that uh, when you saw the invitation, it's a data is the new oil. That uh, first came out uh, in in this magazine. I don't know how many of you re read Wired magazine, uh, but you know, as as far as I can tell, this is the first time that data being referred to as oil. Uh, was actually came out in a major publication. Uh, anyone want to guess what year this came out? No guesses in the chat. Uh, hold on, let me see huh? this in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry, they can't see. Uh, they can't see your slides. You haven't shared it yet. <laughs> I haven't shared. That's why. Okay. Ah, that's why. So there's an article. Oh, there. Okay, let's see. No, no. Uh, Twenty eighteen. Uh, there you go. No data. Wait. Let me look at the. Uh, 
Uh, okay. Let's look at the chat. So, so far, uh, 2006, 1991. Okay. And we got it, 2013. Yeah, Stella Benitez. Congratulations, Stella. <laughs> your, your guess was on the on the dot. So uh, in 2013, uh, Wired Magazine called Data the new oil of the digital economy. And interestingly enough, uh, The Economist echoed, you know, the same headline, except it happened about three years later. Now, in May 2016, uh, The Economist also, so so I guess the message is that nerds are, are a bit more ahead of economists uh, in the information age. You know? Now, why do they call data the new oil? No? Uh, primarily, it's because of what this person, Giovanni Buttarelli said. It's And that's that control of personal data can lead to control of a human being. And can you imagine how valuable that is, right? If you could control people's behaviors, what they buy, how they vote, how they should think. Uh, and just to give you a background, no, Giovanni is the tall person uh, in, in the middle of the photo. He was the European Data Protection Supervisor. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away uh, in August uh, last year, about a year ago. But he was still able to be a guest speaker at the Privacy Awareness Week. No, so some of you who recall PAW 2019, uh, this was from Giovanni's speech. You know, control of personal data can lead to control of a human being. That's me beside him, by the way. And uh, the the other person to to his right, or rather to his left, is uh, Wotek Vivirovsky, who's currently uh, the European Data Protection uh, Supervisor. So you think that's true? No, if someone has more data about you, they can actually control what you're going to think, what you're going to read, and how you're going to vote. I think the answer can even be found in a movie. No, it's called The Great Hack. It's a documentary about Cambridge Analytica and their role in several major political campaigns using data that was taken from Facebook. And I do encourage uh, all of you who are, who are listening today to watch this documentary. It's about an hour and a half. It can be found on Netflix. But it can be clearly seen how the paradigm is changing. Before, we used to say, what? I have nothing to hide. So why am I so concerned about data privacy? But now that paradigm is shifting, right? The more you know about me, the more someone can control me. And in fact, the more they can harm me because they can do identity theft, leading to criminal or malicious activity. Right. So if you remember, uh, you know, long time ago, they used to have what they call this uh, subliminal messaging. You know, you'd be watching a movie and then suddenly you'd feel the need to buy popcorn. It's because, you know, there was this message flashed on the screen so quickly, you know, that it was called subliminal messaging. But nowadays, it's gone a step further. You know, they call it micro-targeting. Um, and... Really, it's aimed at manipulating your behavior using the data that you yourself have given up about you. And what sort of data is this that we're giving up? Well, uh, the pandemic has actually unveiled us no, by, by allowing all this data to come out. What data is this? You know, before, if you wanted to know who I'm meeting or what movies I'm watching or what I'm eating, you'd have to follow me around and, 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 and stalk me. Now, no need to stalk me anymore. Just look at Zoom to see who I'm eating. Netflix, right, to see what I'm watching. Food Panda to know what I'm eating. Zalora to know what I'm buying. And my app called Flipboard to tell you what articles I, I've been reading. And so, you know, in the past six months, more data has been collected. More data has been analyzed. No? And, and yes, no, John, uh, John Marie is saying, they also know what to recommend because once they have that data about you, yes, they can become the choice architect. And so this whole idea of nudging you, in fact, that's the title of the book, right? It's nudge, uh, came from the mind of this uh, author, Richard Thaler. And Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize for his work on behavioral economics, which is all about how people can be nudged so they can make decisions about what to buy, how much to save, you know, what food uh, to, to select. No, and he calls this book, uh, the subtitle is Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness. So, uh, if you uh, don't have time to read the book, then I recommend you go to YouTube. Just do a search on Nudge and Richard Thaler, and you will see 
uh, dozens of videos, literally. Uh, but you, you select the ones that Richard Thaler himself has made. No? And they're short videos, five minute videos, 10 minute videos. And, and he will really show you how uh, you, your, your decision making can be manipulated, can be nudged in certain ways without you even being aware you know, that you're being nudged. Now, that can, of course, have, uh, you know, scary, uh, uh, you know, and con in fact, uh, contradictory, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, connotations. No? So what I'd like to draw your attention to is his co-author. Uh, as you can see there, the co-author is a person named Cass Sunstein. And, and Richard Thaler, while he was an economics professor at Chicago, Cass Sunstein was a law professor and he co-authored this book. And he became quite disturbed by the implications you know, of, of, of uh, behavioral manipulation. So he came up with a book on his, on his, of his own called The Ethics of Influence. Because truly enough, when you're influencing someone, you have to be aware of your ethical motivations for that. So Carl Sunstein wrote this book. Again, if you're, if you're more of a YouTube person, you can also type in Cass Sunstein uh, into YouTube and you'll see that he has several videos. A bit longer, you know, 45 minutes, 60 minutes, but at least you'll be able to get, you know, a sense of what this ethical framework is. You know, when you're nudging someone, when you're influencing someone, how do you know, right, whether your motivations are, are, are proper and good and moral? So what I'll do is I'll pause there, you know, because uh, I, I guess because of the, the this medium that you're in, I cannot see your faces. I don't know if I have your attention, right? And so once in a while, I'd like to pause just to see what's in the Q and A, you know, what's in the chat, uh, and uh, maybe JJ, you can also uh, let me know, right? If there's anything that any any questions uh, there that I can address. Ah, uh, well, I see. I'm seeing uh, uh, recommendations for the great hack. Uh, there are questions on. Hold on. Um, well, they were asking more of Anoy, more of, um, uh, you know, the, the standard questions on, um, uh, how do you call this? I'm sorry. Um, uh, cert certification, I think that's one of the questions that we're seeing here. Uh, let me see. Maybe we'll, uh, no question now, Sabe. No question right now, but excited to move along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do see uh, some questions about speaker notes. Yes, no, I've, I've provided oh, yes. JJ with a, That's right. with a PDF file, no, which he can forward to you. Um, yes. I also want to address right away you know, the question about certification. Uh, yes, there, there are quite a, a lot of uh, certifications being offered. Uh, one of them is from the NADPAP. That's the National Association of DPOs in the Philippines. So you can go to the NADPOP uh, page on Facebook, N-A-D-P-O-P. -P. And uh, I know that JJ is actually also uh, working with the NADPOP officers you know, to, to come up with a certification. Here is, right. uh, here is something though that you have to consider. The law is being amended. No? As we speak, there are, there's a TWG in Congress that's coming up with amendments to the law. Therefore, if you have a certification on, on the Philippine Privacy Act, what happens to that certification if six months from now, 12 months from now, an amended version of the law is passed? And by the way, the, there, there are quite a few major amendments, like there will be fines, uh, you know, administrative fines. So maybe that's something that uh, you, you need to think about. No? Is, if you take a certification now, will you be allowed to take a refresher certification so that you don't have to take the whole exam? You can just take the questions related to uh, the amendments you know, in, in the law. See, yeah, other questions. There are some questions related to the, I think the best addressed by the NPC. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, we don't have anyone from the NPC and unless JJ, you have someone hidden. I don't know. I, uh, uh, no, I don't have anyone. There's a question here about uh, school administrators dropping by during online classes to monitor the classes. Are there privacy uh, parameters on this? You know, it's, uh, it's simply just like the uh, classroom. 
right? Uh, the DepEd uh, has given uh, school administrators uh, custodial responsibilities. You know? And so, of course, they have to carry those out. So just like with, uh, uh, you know, we have a framework of law, some related to healthcare, some related to education. And so you cannot, of course, just take the Data Privacy Act in a vacuum you know, and say that, hey, all, all of these other things no longer apply. Now you have to look at the, uh, the 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 bills relate the, the laws related to education and the administration of education, now, to realize that again, or they have they have that custodial responsibility. Now, of course, you might say that applies if they're on the campus, right? But will that also apply uh, <laughs> online in the virtual world? Well, why not, right? Because it's a virtual classroom. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh... There, or you want to go over some of the questions now? Uh, sure. How to you formulate know, privacy management program and privacy impact assessment? This is a very timely oh, okay. question. Yeah, those will cover. We will cover those. Okay, yeah. we'll cover later. Yeah. Uh, how yeah. to decide as a person on how much personal data we should give at a certain situation? Uh, this is interesting. Sorry, I'll, yeah, I'll read it in. Yeah. Do you have a suggestion on how we can decide as a person how much data data we should give uh, at a certain situation? Yeah, you know, one of the sayings that I came up with is that, is that privacy is the proxy for trust, right? Because you have to know uh, who to trust and, and to what extent, right? Before you uh, reveal all this data and, and, and remove the shield of privacy. So there are certain things that you can see to develop that trust. One of them, of course, is a privacy notice. You know, does this company that's collecting data from you you know, give you a privacy notice and tell you clearly what they'll be using that data for, how long they will be keeping it, you know, who they'll be sharing it and how they're securing it. Another thing that I look for is a data protection officer. Usually there's a note somewhere on the screen or in the website or in the, the application form that says, if you have any questions or complaints, talk to this person, He's our, he or she is our data protection officer. Other things I would look for would include certifications. Uh, ISO 27701, 27701 is one certification which, which says that this company has put in place a protocol, no, a policy and procedures on, on how to manage uh, the privacy, the information that's been entrusted to them. Uh, another certification is called the CBPR, uh, Cross-Border Privacy Rule Certification. So APEC, uh, accountability agents would give that certification, which basically says that the company that has that certification uh, can be entrusted with data. And even if they transfer data across borders, they will keep it safe and secure and private. So hopefully that, that gives you some idea you know, of, of you know, who to trust really with the data, yeah, with your personal data. So maybe another tip would be give a little at a time, and you know if if what you've given uh, has not been protected, has not been secured, then you know don't give them any more. In fact, erase the app. You know, maybe take it off from your phone. That's right. Sometimes it's hard to control, no? Uh, when you give your consent uh, on the end. There's an interesting question here. What's the difference between a data privacy notice and a data privacy policy from Darwin De Luna? Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, I, I don't have the slide which says that, right? but look at it as the two sides of a coin. The notice is what you present to the data subject. And that's why we often call that the external policy. The internal policy, what you show to your employees has to be a reflection. So if your notice says, I will collect you know, uh, your cell phone, your name, your address, the collection policy should also say the same thing because they should be uh, mirror images. If your data privacy notice says, I will keep your data for five years, then your disposal policy should say, any data that's older than five years, we have to dispose of. Again, because they have to be consistent with each other. Now, so sometimes you'll hear the, hear the term external policy for the data privacy notice and internal policy for the manuals, the procedures and so on. Okay, so maybe let's move on. 
Uh, but but this is good, no? Because uh, like I said, I don't want to keep talking, and everyone's already falling asleep. So I will pause at certain portions, no, to to check if everyone's awake and to get questions. So because data is the new oil, no? Because it's so important that it can be used to harm people and manipulate their behavior. Governments around the world have passed all sorts of data privacy uh, legislation. No, and uh, you can see this is a map from the IAPP website, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, uh, which is another organization that I represent. Uh, many countries have passed laws, you know, the ones in blue, which include the Philippines, already have omnibus laws. Uh, other countries that are in orange are in the process uh, of passing or drafting these laws. And the circle that I've drawn, that's the circle that I, that's the area that I'm responsible for, Asia Pacific. It's got about 17 different countries, um, multiple time zones, uh, many, many different languages and dialects. And so those are some of the challenges that I face as a regional DPO, uh, having to uh, keep track you know, of what are all the new sorts of laws that are coming up. Uh, just to contrast it you know, with, with uh, someone who's uh, my counterpart, you know, let's say in Europe, uh, my counterpart there would be handling the GDPR country. So that may cover you know, about 28, 29 countries, but at least they, they all have one law. Right? And so there, there are some uh, benefits you know, to, to just having one, one, one law for, for several countries. Of course, in Asia Pacific, we're trying to at least come up with what we call common standards. No? So I think I mentioned APEC, CBPR as one common standard. Uh, ASEAN is also coming up with a data framework. No? So with all these laws, uh, that has given rise to a new career and that's the career of the privacy professional. So again, this is an article that came out some, some years ago, uh, probably 2017, 2018, you know, where they actually said that the DPO is the hottest tech ticket in town. So it's a job uh, that, that hundreds of thousands, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of now switch their careers not to uh, becoming DPOs. And we know that because there have been uh, registration and certifications no? uh, in, in the EU, for example, because of their law called the GDPR, uh, there are close to 400,000 that have now registered. In the Philippines, we have uh, I think about 25,000 uh, registered DPOs, you know, and, and the numbers are, are quite similar you know, in, in, in other countries. Now, uh, I think we also saw, uh, JJ, that we have some small companies here as well as large companies. I just want to, to let you know, I, I can empathize with you, you know, because in the 17 countries that I handle, some of those countries, we have less than 30 employees. So that's basically a, 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 you know, small, uh, in some we have uh, we have 100 employees. In some we have 5,000 employees. And in the larger countries we have close to 50,000 employees. You know? So just within APAC, there's a wide variety. Uh, and I do have DPOs. You know? So each of these countries would also have their own DPO uh, reporting into the into the regional office. And our regions, of course, report into the global. Right, but I can also empathize with with some of you, you know, uh, attending today with regard to the size of the company. Don't don't think that just because I'm talking from, you know, the perspective of of a large multinational, that, you know, that's that's uh, the only experience that I have. Uh, I can really empathize with the smaller companies, you no, know, uh, 10, 15 employees, and I know how difficult it is, you know, to implement some of these practices. To find out more you know, about really how to be a DPO and, and what are the roles and responsibilities, uh, there's no better place than to go to the uh, law itself. You know, the, the Data Privacy Act, Section 21B, which is echoed in the IRR Section 50B says that each uh, organization that handles personal data must appoint an individual or it can be several you non know, individuals who are accountable for the organization's compliance with this act. Right? And again, the key word there is accountable. You know? uh, as a DPO, you're not gonna be there 24 hours a day, seven days a week to look at each and every form that's being collected. Right? But you, and, and so it's really those persons at the front lines, you know, the, the ones who are handling the data, 
who could be put in jail, no? But uh, the accountability means at least you're there to train them, or to show them the right way. And the only time really that a DPO should go to jail is if they themselves commit a criminal act or if there's gross negligence. No? But uh, most of the time, I think what we're really seeing is that uh, a, a lot of the violations are happening, not at the level of the DPO, but they're happening at the front lines. There's a clerk you know, who forgot to do something. There's a security guard you know, who was unable to perform the duty. And, and so there was a data breach. You know, there's uh, somebody who forgot to lock the door, you know, uh, so on and so forth. There's a webmaster who put some data you know, on the website, right? So, uh, but I think in, in most of the cases, you know, at least those that I handled when I was there at the NPC, it was not the DPO you know, who was at fault. It's not the DPO who would go to jail you know, if, if, if ever. Okay. Uh, and then of course the, the advisory, this is about a 10 page advisory, which is expands this one line in the law is called advisory. 2017-01. Uh, again, uh, you can download it from the uh, NPC website. And I do recommend though, that you, you look at this if you're interested in becoming a DPO and pursuing a career you know, in, in the privacy profession. So what's a DPO? Again, someone who's accountable for compliance. And so I, what I'd like to do is for the rest of this uh, one hour or so, you know, is to talk, really talk about the different aspects of compliance. Uh, again, like I said, I'll show two to three slides. Then we'll talk about the first bullet point, then we'll stop for questions. Go to the second one and we'll stop for questions. Uh, hopefully also that avoids, you know, when sometimes you ask a question at the end and we don't, I don't even remember anymore what slide you were referring to. So as much as possible, no, please ask the questions while the, while the slide is still fresh in our minds. So let's talk about the first one. No? Paper compliance versus operational compliance. Where did this term come from? Well, it's there in the circular 1802, uh, which is called guidelines on compliance checks. And in this circular, the NPC says there are three types of compliance checks that they can do. One is called the privacy sweep, where they will just look at your website and look at the forms and posters around your, you know, without even telling you that they're there. The second one is called the document submission. And the document submission, that's where they'll send you a letter and ask you to submit certain documents like your privacy notice, your manuals, your PIA, and so on. The third type of compliance check is the on-site visit, where they'll actually visit your premises, interview your employees, uh, maybe even look at your uh, uh, physical, technical, and uh, organizational controls for securing data. So those are the three types of compliance checks. No? And paper compliance is one way to address the privacy sweep and the document submission, because really here it's mo more of a desktop exercise. No? Uh, of course, this will uh, help you mitigate legal consequences such as penalties, compliance orders, and lawsuits. And in order to pass you know, paper compliance, what do you need? You have to have your documents always up to date and your document should always be synchronized. Like I said, consistency. You know? If in your privacy notice it says, I will share your data with companies A, B, and C, then you should also have data sharing agreements with A, B, and C. If your privacy notice says, I will share your data with A, B, and C, then when the NPC comes, you can only show data sharing agreements with A and B already, you're not in compliance. You know? Already your documentation is out of date. You know? So that's why it's very important, of course, to have paper compliance. But paper compliance is not enough. It has to be aligned with how the people are behaving, how your employees, how your frontliners are behaving. Right? So operational compliance means that employee behavior is aligned with all those nice policies, all those nice manuals and procedures that you have. You know, as one of the uh, company presidents uh, told me, right, he said, we need to move to what he calls a zero breach mindset. Because you know, when it comes to data privacy, one person's misconduct can tarry the entire, tarnish the entire organization, right? 
So you really have to make sure that you know you've trained everyone, you've conducted audits and inspections, so that you know they, they don't make this silly mistake uh, which tarnishes and 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 brings everyone uh, at risk. So that's what organizational compliance is all about. It addresses customer scrutiny because it's really the customers that are looking, you know, with eagle eyes towards all these things happening with the data that you collect from them. It will also help you to meet the on-site visit. Remember, that's the third mode of the compliance check that I talked about. And so operational compliance helps you meet operational, mitigate operational risk. Things like cyber criminals, hackers, right? things like earthquakes, fires, which would cause loss of data. So all these things you know, can result in business disruption, right? Uh, costs to bring back and build that data. You know, so that's what we call remediation costs. Uh, customers leaving you know, because of your, 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 your data breaches, you know, your, your lost reputation. So all of those are what we call the real world consequences and your operational risks. And all the best policies and manuals in the world will not be able to prevent that from happening. The only thing that can prevent that from happening is operational compliance, which means your employees are behaving you know, in, the, in alignment with your data privacy policies and procedures. So that's not easy to do, right? That, that entails a lot of what we call culture change. Uh, it requires building a culture of privacy through a variety of plans and programs. It's not a one-time thing where you conduct training and then you expect them to remember it. No. You have to have posters. You have to have reminders. When they log on, you know, there are these uh, pop-ups. I remember, you know, before uh, the pandemic, I would visit some banks and I would see even in the elevators, you know, uh, in the bulletin boards, there would be all these kinds of reminders helping to build that culture of privacy. Okay. So, uh, yeah, someone's talking about bad weather uh, and, and the materials. Yeah, so maybe the, the, the bad weather is causing the internet to be uh, shaky. Anyway, uh, like I said, no, let me pause again for questions. Yeah, I will be, I have provided uh, JJ with some of the uh, materials already. Uh, Zar okay. Patrick is saying, yeah, to invest in real, really in strong data must be the, uh, the new paradigm. Yeah, please, JJ, let's look at some of the questions. Hold on, uh, actually, there are questions from, uh, from uh, people who joined on Facebook. Um, uh, okay, um, so there's talking about digital transformation in the Philippines. Since digital transformation depends on the availability of data, will it require centralization of information so as to facilitate governance? Do you think a national ID system would help uh, make this happen? And this person yeah. citing the, uh, go ahead. I, mean, I think whether or not we have a national ID uh, should not affect the, the way that, that we put in place our controls. No? I mean, there are some uh, uh, countries that have national IDs already where they've been able to implement, you know, data private, but, but other countries, no, even without a national ID, uh, the, the awareness is already there. No? I mean, that's one of the differences I see from one country to another, actually. Uh, you know, India, which is part of the, uh, the the region that I looked after, yeah, they do have Ardhar. Uh, New Zealand also has, you know. Uh, uh, so th the, the differences between countries are more along the lines of uh, culture. You know? So, you know, like I talked about this culture of privacy, right? One of the things that are so different from one country to another is the ability to question authority. You know, uh, Japan, for example, I worked in Tokyo for, for some time and you would not question the boss. But what you do with the boss is after work, this is why you, you would see so many people in bars. After work, you go out, you have a few drinks of sake and then you can say anything to your boss. You can criticize him. You can say you don't like you know, what he did about this policy or that policy. And basically everything that you could not say in the office, you can say it under the guise of being uh, your parai. You know? uh, the next day you just come back and say, sorry, I was drunk. I didn't know what I was saying. When actually the boss was listening to you. Because even the boss knows that there are some criticisms 
that he or she must listen to. So Japanese, that's the way they do it. That's Koreans, not a bad way to do things. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Koreans, no, it's it's zip. No criticism. And I don't know if you've read the book. Uh, I think it's called The Tipping Point no, by Malcolm Gladwell. Okay. Gladwell. Where he talks about why certain uh, airlines, national airlines, would have a higher level of crashes. No, I was because, going to say that. I was going to mention that. Yeah, right. because you know, if you question the authority of the pilot in the cockpit, uh, you know, does your culture allow that or not? So that's one of the questions. Is really, you no? Know, can you escalate if you you see something that's that you don't like or something that goes against, you know, the Data Privacy Act? Can you talk to the boss of your boss? Can you actually go straight, you know, to the management committee or the board? And what will be the consequence on you if you do that? You know, will you be seen as a, a whistleblower? You know, will you be ostracized, or will will you actually be uh, protected? You know, from from backlash. Uh, yeah, JG. Sorry. So what are yeah, some? Of wait, the... sorry. There, there was. Yeah, hold on. Uh, oh, there's a very good question here from Nanette uh, Dedel Padilla. So she's complaining about uh, the data privacy policies, the consent forms that she's been seeing, they're always in fine print and have to be ticked in a hurry. Can't they be in infographics? Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> right? She's just asking that question. Right. Uh, there's a website. Okay. And JJ, I hope you don't mention, mind if I mention the website. It's called the Artificial Lawyer, right? Uh -huh. so in the, it's called the Artificial Lawyer. <laughs> anyway, in that website, there are actually examples of uh, privacy notices that you do use in infographics, no? So uh, take a look at that. That, that might be one uh, uh, way. Now, I do recall a case you know, in South Korea where the, the judge uh, at the Supreme Court said, told the company that font is too small. And because that font is too small, you did not obtain real consent. Uh, and I, I know you can uh, imagine you know, the Hangul uh, character set and can you imagine how, reading that in five-point font? Uh, it's quite difficult, no. And so, that's actually uh, it's 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 jurisprudence, no. So the, the in hmm. South Korea, the judge has actually said, you know, uh, you have to allow your data subjects to be able to read that. Otherwise, you know, what you're obtaining is not uh, true consent. Yeah. So I think one of the one of, I, I was talking to a, a, a data privacy professional earlier, or some a few weeks ago, and, uh, and he was telling me that uh, this should be simple. It should not be complicated, uh, because isn't it that you just look at the situation and you make a commitment to protect this person's privacy? But I think in many in many companies, correct me if I'm wrong, it's also a there's a balancing act that's happening, because certainly the company itself, as you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, there's a there's a commercial interest in your in your data. Yeah, and, and part of it would be negligence. You know, how uh, how vigilant are are, are people? You know? And you know, I think this is where the golden rule comes in, right? Uh, I I know that for a lot of us, we we have to realize first of all how important personal data is to our own uh, right, our our own uh, identities and our, our our own lives, and then. The golden rule comes in: do unto others as you want them to do unto you, right? So, uh, you know, for in, in with many of the companies that I was consulting with, you know, before I joined Citibank, uh, th there was that malasakit, you know, and and, and uh, I think it, that's the best way to say it in Tagalog. Really, is you know, if 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 you if your data is important to you and and you realize how people can harm you with it. When you are handling someone else's data, whether that be your patient, your depositor, your student, right? You should then treat it the same way that you want your own data to be treated. You know, when you go to a bank, when you go to a telco, when you go to a hospital. That's right. So there, you mentioned uh, about a uh, hospital. There are questions here about uh, do hospital clinics have to have their VPOs? Uh, it seems like they should. So he answered his own question. Uh, Rona pala, so she answered her yes, own question. Yes. Uh, I said, uh, but can they delegate the tasks of a DPO to the person who handles, say, their website or somebody else in the organization? 
yeah, again, no, there's uh, uh, what we look at is conflict of interest. Now, there should be no conflict of interest. There should be independence and objectivity. And, and those are explained no, in, in the advisory. Uh, there are some, uh, uh, the, the advisory also says ideally the person should be your employee and, and therefore not a consultant. So the role cannot be outsourced actually. Functions okay. can be outsourced. No? So like if a DPO has to do 10 things, you can take eight or nine of those and have someone do them for you. But the role itself, the title uh, has to belong to an employee you know, within the organization. And uh, one of the things that a Comelec decision said was if uh, there is no DPO, then the head of the organization is the de facto DPO. Ah, okay, de facto EP, DPO. There's a related question, and this is actually a deep question, I think, uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, uh, in our situation now, uh, we have the pandemic and every establishment is collecting personal information before we can enter it. How can we ensure that our data will be safe and not used illegally? Um, is asked by Jason Martinez. I think there's a lot of uh, anxiety right now. And I understand that uh, I think it was uh, Android and iOS actually installed some uh, standards no, for, for yeah. collecting uh, yeah. COVID-related uh, information. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, again, uh, we have to be clear whether what they're collecting is uh, health data or location data. Right. And in, in the law, we differentiate between what we call PI, personal information, and SPI, you know, sensitive personal information. Right? And I wouldn't trust my sensitive inform, personal information or SPI you know, to just anyone. You know? Now, PI, on the other hand, uh, there are, aside from consent, you know, there is what we call uh, protection of vital interests. You know? If that data can be used to, to help me protect myself and my family from being infected, then for me, that's a good enough reason. But draw the distinction. I think, and yes, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a situation where uh, you have all these uh, uh, COVID-related apps collecting your, say, your location and who you, inter if everybody has it, so you will, they will know who you were close to. And then if you're COVID positive, it might send messages to everyone and can be used for contact tracing. The question, the problem, of course, is if you, you don't get uh, infected. They have all this data about hyper, Ah, accurate okay. data about who you interacted with. Right. And no, it's a question think, of trust, as you mentioned. Yeah. And I think that's why some of the databases are uh, supposed to be deleted after 14 days, right? Because if I come into contact with someone and, you know, for the next 14 days, neither I nor that person show symptoms, then, in fact, that's considered the best test, no? Better even than a swab test, right? And so... Uh, that's why that data should be deleted now after 14 days. That makes perfect sense. So, yeah. so some people will push it to maybe 28 days, I mean, just in case you were asymptomatic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a very good question here from uh, Zadam Blanzabides. Is it mandatory for all government agencies, branches of the government, regardless of manpower strength, uh, and the uh, nature of services to assign a DPO on its respective offices? Yeah, so uh, because government is the largest collector of data and uh, in a sense no, has the public authority to, to collect so much data, then uh, if, it, if the data is personal data, then yes, of course, no, they should appoint uh, a DPO. DILG, for example, has issued its own uh, memorandum order on that. Uh, uh, CHET, you know, uh, DTI, all, all these other, all, many of these agencies have issued their own internal you know, administrative orders on that. And uh, Circular 16-01, the very first circular that the NPC came up with emphasizes the need you know, for uh, a DPO for each government agency that processes personal information. So yes, yes, government is expected to be the first uh, to comply. And in fact, when I mentioned earlier that there have been compliance checks, uh, the bulk of the compliance checks that the NPC has conducted have been on uh, government agencies. Okay, there's another question here. I go from the big to the small. For small companies, do they need to register? This is from Alan Aldea. 
Yeah, the, the, the registration uh, is in circular 17-01. Again, these are things that can be downloaded and there are specific criteria. So you can be a small company of three employees, right? But you have millions of records because you've created a fantastic app you know, that people have downloaded. So the size of the company is not the determinant. No? It's really the number of records that you hold. Right. So actually, I've seen, uh, I understand uh, doctors who practice, uh, even though they practice on their own, their own clinic, the doctor himself uh, registers registered, as, a, right. as a DPO. Uh, there's a related question. If you register your DPO, do you need to register your compliance officer for privacy or your COP? Uh, registration process is actually... Uh, a process to, to register your systems. But in order for the NPC to know who is the authorized person, no? sino ba yung pwedeng um, magsalita para sa kumpanya, yung tao na yon is called the DPO, right? And so you don't have to register 10 people. Just register one and that person that you register is understood to be the DPO who can undergo the registration process for your company. Okay, it's another interesting. Ano. So talking about DPOs, and it seems like it's a, an interesting uh, position to hold, uh, given that a lot of data is is uh, is uh, in digital format. Is it a prerequisite for a DPO to have an IT background? What is your view? Uh, well, yeah, definitely. Uh, you you need to actually be able to combine uh, several skill sets. Now, from the last slide, remember, I talked about behavioral change. So you have to know about change management. No? Uh, you, you have to know about project management because, uh, you know, oftentimes these programs that you're running through take time. And yes, it helps to know IT. It helps to know the law. So that's, I think, one of the challenges no, uh, that a lot of DPOs are facing is being able to uh, gain you know, the, the, these skills in, or competencies in, in different areas. No? Uh, just quickly, I think, okay, let's move on. I don't want to spend too much time also yeah. because uh, okay. yeah, we, we want to progress. But one of the questions, Lizeri, Saraga, for example, ask, are e-signatures, you know, can they be used without the consent of the owner? Right? And if you take a look at our law, consent is not the only uh, means for processing. There can be legitimate interest. right? And so, again, uh, for, for many of us, that's something that we very quickly have to realize no, about uh, the Data Privacy Act. Uh, it, it's, it says consent is king, but if you don't have consent, yes, there are other things that the company can use. Now, uh, from my experience, right, in, in several companies that I've seen, both that come to us, at the, that came to us at the NPC, uh, and after the, I left the NPC, I had several uh, consulting clients. Uh, for me, this was the first thing I would ask them is, does your company follow the rules of the game? Right? Because if you don't have a culture of compliance, it's very difficult to implement all of these you know, uh, data privacy principles and, and uh, policies, right? So what I'd like you to do now is, uh, just on a piece of paper, you know, I'll ask you six questions. And for each question, write down whether you're one or ten or somewhere in between. Okay. And in fact, JJ yeah, will be JJ yeah, will be I'll putting share up the poll. a poll. Yeah. But maybe JJ, before you put the poll, so again, let okay. me let me go through the six questions. No? Yeah, go through the six questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here's the first question. And again, you can just write this down on your paper or uh, scribble it, right? Uh, the first question is, in the company, are there a few sacred employees who are always taken care of, right? Or would you say we take care of all employees, uh, regardless of kung sino yung kilala nila? Okay. Because a positive workforce environment where employees trust the company, Will uh, will be something where they'll. This is what we call a level playing field, no. And even if I I, I report, you know, someone's misbehavior, uh, they will listen to me, no matter who I am, no matter who that person is. 
right? Because it's a level playing field. So where are you there? No, are you at one? Are you at ten? Somewhere in the middle, you know. And just just write it down. The next question is: Do you know what your risk appetite is? Right? Do your employees know whether they're taking a silly risk doing something, or whether this is not allowed by the company? In other words, you have a well-defined risk strategy that defines you know, what your risk appetite is for the various types of risk, whether it be compliance risk, reputational risk, financial risk. Again, are you at one or are you at 10? Then the third uh, question I would ask is, uh, how do you fix a problem? You know, when there's a problem in your company, do they fix it and say, okay, that's good, by the day on, let's move somewhere else. Uh, and, and of course, the risk with Band-Aid solutions is oftentimes once you move on to the next thing, the Band-Aid fails. No? Or are you a company where uh, you put in place uh, Band-Aid, but you still continue looking for solutions that are sustainable you know, so that when you put a solution, you will know that it's fixed. Okay. Fourth question, and, I, and like the, I said, there are only six. You know? So the fourth question is, uh, when mistakes are made, is it clear? you know, who is accountable. You know? In other words, there's a decision flow chart. It's clear at what level the decision was made. You know? There's a framework that clearly delineates accountabilities. Or are you in a situation where, oops, something happened, and sad to say, this is like what happened in the, remember the explosion in Beirut, you know, uh, just a few days ago in Lebanon where they're not even clear. No, they're, they're, they cannot point fingers at anyone because they don't even know who to point the finger at. Then question number five, uh, do you have a whistleblower policy? No, if you don't have one, then you're at you know, zero or one. But if you have a policy, does it protect the employee from retaliation? Does it ensure that, that you can uh, have anonymity if needed? No, then again, put, put a, um, a circle there on your score. And last but not least, now does management walk the talk? Uh, I've seen so many companies where they say, this is our ethical framework. These are the, quest the three questions, the four questions that you should ask you know, in order to come up with a decision. Uh, and yet, you, sometimes you see management, they're doing something, but they, they don't seem to have asked themselves you know, those three questions. So do you have an ethical culture where employees are clear about the boundaries of moral behavior and what they're supposed to do or, or not supposed to do. Okay. So, Sige, JJ, yeah, why don't you launch the poll and let's just give everyone a few minutes to just click on, on, yeah. on where they are there. Yeah. Maybe you can answer some questions. <laughs> uh, let me see. So there's a question here about, uh, about China. Are there, are there data privacy laws in China? And that might be an unfair question, I don't know. Well, yeah, yes, there are actually. And in fact, the civil code, China passed on July 1, uh, a new civil code, which guarantees privacy protections to citizens you know, of China. So this was the, actually the first time that a law was passed, which actually has the word privacy on it. Before that, they would call it uh, security standards. You know? So they had a personal information security specification, they had a security law, um, you know, information protection and so on. But in the civil code, uh, they've introduced you know, this concept of privacy rights. Okay. Uh, there's a question here about uh, two questions relating to consent. Uh, is there an expiration date for privacy consent? Yeah, yeah. The the answer is no. Uh, but a uh, consent can be withdrawn, and consent can be given for a fixed period of time, right? So this is in uh, section uh, 19 of the IRR, okay, where it talks about uh, consent for a fixed period. And I'll give you a reason why. Now, for example, you're, you're working with a travel agent who's arranging a trip for you. Uh, and at the end of the trip, you, you no longer want to deal with that travel agent. Obviously, you can withdraw your consent. 
But let's say you forgot to withdraw your consent, then at the time that you gave consent, you can always tell them that, you know, this consent is only good for three months. Uh, because after that, uh, you know, I, I'd like to try a different travel agency or, or something or the other. So yes, uh, there, you, you can, as a condition of giving consent, uh, specify that there's a period of time, which in effect, yeah, is an expiration date. Right, so I guess, uh, yeah, that was in the implementing rules and regulations, the withdrawal yes. of uh, consent. And I'm wondering, from the standpoint of, uh, your, like yourself, uh, from a management standpoint, uh, I'm sure in city you handle, you know, lots and lots of personal information. If somebody withdraws consent, that must that might be a difficult from a uh, yeah, from that's a management absolutely right. Perspective, no? You know, when, when a customer, uh, with, you know, withdraws their consent, then you have to stop processing, you know. And uh, I've seen a law. In, in the, it's the uh, both the Thai law and the Indonesian law say that you're only given three days from the time that the consent is withdrawn. You have to stop processing in three days. Otherwise, you can already be fined. Oh gosh. Yeah. But there now, are. Yeah. Go ahead. But you know, there's actually also a type of consent that expires, which is the consent that the parent has given for the child. Right, because once the child, uh, you know, has reached the age of consent, uh, then you should ask that person, you know, who's no longer a child, for their consent, because they can always say, "You never asked me for my consent. You just relied on the consent of my parents," and and that has already expired. Right. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we have to be. Uh, I, and I think there are some companies. This is called consent management. A lot of companies are now looking at uh, software add-ons or new features you know, in their uh, systems where they actually have a field. You know, what does the what does this person, this data subject consented to? And for how long is this consent valid for? Okay, how many okay. have voted? Yeah. Uh thirty-five percent. Major next stop now. So I guess uh oh, yeah, let's, so, let's oh, wait, wait, wait. No, some people are still submitting. Wait. Uh, yeah. okay, so yeah. So I'll, yeah. I'll end the poll, guys. Uh, I hope I'm not uh so we'll give them twenty more seconds and then I'll cut off. But we get about a third of the audience uh know uh, responded. Uh okay, three, two, one, I end, and then I will publish uh, share results. There you go. Okay, so, yeah. Now, uh, I saw some of you in the chat window totaling your scores. And here's the thing that I'll tell you. That you there's no totaling the scores. Your lowest score is your company score. Now, like if a company came to me and they said, oh, we scored 10 in everything. But in number one, our score was two. You know, our score was three. I'll say, that's your weakest link. You know, and that's what you have to work on, right? So... Uh, some of you have said, yeah, there's this, uh, there's no playing field when it comes to employees. So if that's the lowest, lowest score among the six questions, that's the first thing you have to start taking care of, right? If company, if, if employees see, oh, there, there are these favored, you know, a uh, few trying to cut corners, they themselves will also try to cut corners whenever they can. No? But I'm glad to see that the majority are saying, you know, uh, 31%, which is where the most are, is saying we take care of all employees. Okay. Risk appetite, I'm not surprised at the answer. No, that the majority, the one in the orange bar, is is where most of you landed. And in fact, that's why I've included a, a few slides uh, in this talk to talk about risk appetite. No? But um, it's good to see that some of you, uh, you know, 18% uh, of you have, uh, you know, a risk appetite, you know, score of eight there. So the eight and the 10, uh, eight and 10 are actually the second and third highest. No? Solutions, oh wow, okay. So I think uh, many of us know the result. If you just do band-aid solutions, it, it just keeps, keeps coming back, you know? And so you're the one who ends up getting tense about it, you know? But that's good that many uh, are actually look for su sustainable solutions. Uh, uh, accountability also, no, we have, uh, you know, 33 or, or the, the most number of companies. Whistleblower, wow, that's that's the biggest, no? I think so for this group, 27% uh, say we have no whistleblower policy and, and that's the biggest bucket. 
No, and, and as I said, when it comes to data privacy, oftentimes it's the frontliner. No, I've I've seen some companies where it was the security guard that blew the whistle and said, "Sir, you know, in the Tayo Compliance and Data Privacy Act," and that was good because the the security guard attended a briefing on data privacy, and because he attended a briefing, he he was able to to blow the whistle. And then ethical standards, uh, great. No, so a lot of you have said you do have ethical standards, and that's where the, the most of you. Uh, uh, answered. So again, uh, please don't add up your scores. Go to the lowest score no, because the, the lowest score here is your where your weakest link is. And once you've moved the needle on that one, then you go to the next lowest score and then you move that up and then you go to the next one. But uh, just to let you know, right, even at the NPC, when we would seek uh, companies that had problems, it's not just in one area, no. Uh, one company, actually, in, uh, one company had issues with data protection, and when we dug deeper, we saw they also had uh, issues with sexual harassment, as well as racial discrimination. Right. So, oftentimes these compliance problems come in groups. Uh, another company they had a data sharing violation, and then uh, when we dug deeper, we saw that in the past they also had a violation for financial uh, misreporting. And there were also questions at the DTI on raffles that they would do because the, the employees' relatives were winning most of the raffles, okay? So you can see that uh, why that culture compliance questionnaire is so important, right? It can tell you that there are problems, not just when you do start to do your data privacy compliance, but many other areas of the company as well. And really, it's almost difficult to expect your data privacy project to be successful if you don't have a culture of compliance, okay? So once you have that culture of compliance, right, then you can start to work on your processes. You know? uh, and, and here's a, a key point, though. No? You cannot talk about a company that's compliant without looking at each of the processes. Right? Because if you have 10 processes in your company, you cannot say, oh, my company is compliant, but because nine out of 10 are compliant, nine processes. No, you have to go to the process level and then check that each process is compliant before you can now say that your company is compliant, right? So how do you build compliant processes? And here, when we talk about processes, uh, again, this is the definition no, from the law. It's any system, procedure, or activity which involves the processing of personal data. And again, the law defines what personal data is. But just to give you an example, processing a credit card or a loan application, uh, that's, a call, that's one process. No? Recruiting a new employee, that's another process. Okay. So the most important person in building a compliant process is the process owner. And if the process is not compliant, it's the process owner who will be the first person that the NPC will call for a hearing, okay? And that's why it's so important you know, when you're doing all your compliance building, you identify first what are all those processes, then you identify who are the owners of the process. Because this is the person who will define what data is to be collected how it will be processed and what budget you will have to put in place controls. Now, the process owner is the person who is measured by this process. Either they have a quota, no, they have a performance objective, they have a goal. No, and that's why this process is so important for them. So uh, this is the person who wants to deliver business results. So that oftentimes they'll be defensive. You'll come to them and you'll say, Oh, we need to change this. We need to put this in place. You'll say, but wait a minute. If I do those changes, I might not reach my quota. I might not reach my goal. So you can you can expect many times that the process owner will be defensive. That's why you need the help of someone else from the business. And this someone else is the COP, what we call the Compliance Officer for Privacy. And usually this COP is a more senior person who is part of the business, someone who has been in the business longer and someone who is more experienced than the process owner. 
Now, the COP is given the responsibility of ensuring that all processes in their part of the business are compliant. I'll give you an example. Let's say the process owner is your recruitment head or the process owner is your uh, comp and ben, you know, the one who takes care of payroll. Then the compliance officer for privacy is usually the HR head. Now, because this person, the head of HR, knows you know, what are all the tricks uh, you know, of the trade when it comes to HR. So uh, if there's a breach, you know, if there's a violation in recruitment, of course you call the recruitment manager, but you're also going to call the head of HR, the VP for HR. You know? That's why it makes sense to involve uh, this, this HR head and call that person the compliance officer for privacy. So you can also have a compliance officer for privacy in, in your loan section or in your deposit section, et cetera, in your insurance section. So that, that, that's how you should view this. No? Uh, if you have a company with 80 processed owners, maybe you'll have five COPs. Okay? But the key point here is that's why they're in the blue side of the box. Their expertise is the business. They know a little bit about privacy, but they are really experts in running the business and getting the results of the business. And so whenever they come up with a new product, a new service, a new process, they have to consult experts. And these experts come from the green side you know, of the picture. So these are subject matter experts. Maybe they are the people who know the law. They know the technology and they know the Data Privacy Act. So typically, this is where you bring in the DPO, okay, the data privacy expert. And so this is the team. Now, this is the group that will sit down at the, sta at the design stage of every new process, new product, or new service. And they make sure that they sit down and they talk about what data is being collected, how are we securing it, so that it's privacy by design. From the very beginning, you're designing that new process, that new product, that new activity with privacy and compliance in mind. And you don't build it in later as an afterthought, okay? So if you hear the term privacy by design, that's what this means. Bringing these people together at the beginning while you're still still designing or, or redesigning the process. Now, how do you document what they talk about, right? Because all of them will have to say, these are the risks, these are the controls, these are the things that we collect. In uh, the Privacy Act, we talk about something called the Privacy Impact Assessment or a PIA. And the PIA is the document that all of these uh, talk, talk to, to ensure that they're all on the same page. This is the single document that captures everyone's point of view and allows each one to contribute their own expertise into the mix. Now, depending on the complexity of the process that's being designed, a PIA can take half a day or it can take half a month or even longer. But it's really important to get it right. And, and that's why, uh, you know, when I look at the Asia Pacific region, several regulators have said, this is a required document. Now, Philippines, of course, has said you must do a PIA. Uh, Singapore is also adding that as one of its amendments. South Korea, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, you know, uh, all these regulators have mentioned the need to assess the risk, to assess the privacy risk or the privacy impact. And so uh, as a DPO, this is one of the things you must have in, in your toolkit. You know? And if you want to learn more about PIAs, again, uh, there is a document on the NPC website called Advisory 2017-03. Now, and here it talks about process owners and the importance of the process owner. And if you put it together with 2017-01, which talks about DPOs and COPs, you have to read these two together right, to understand that whole paradigm of privacy by design. Okay. Again, and again, let me pause there because I think that that covers quite a bit. So Rowena just asked a question. As a new DPO, what do I need to do? Uh, again, like I mentioned here, get the list of the processes and who those process owners are, uh, and then document your, your PIA. Now that's, that's one way to start. In fact, the NPC calls this the five pillars of compliance. Step one, appoint a DPO. Step two, conduct your PIA. 
once after you've done the PIA, by the way, uh, step three in the pillars is to come up with your uh, privacy management uh, program, you know, which includes having your policies and procedures, but that's just paper compliance, right? So step four is implementing it so that you can now have your operational compliance. And step five is actually doing a beach drill. So you can check whether all the controls you put in place are actually working. You know, it's almost like doing an audit. Right. So the, yeah. Yeah. yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, no, because I, 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 mean, I agree with you uh, completely. I think the, the first step really is to um, uh, look at your processes, what information your uh, company is uh, processing. And then, um, uh, although consent is not the, the, the only way to legally process information, it's probably easier to write a consent form so, um, if, and you can't have a consent form unless you know what, uh, what information you're processing and how you're processing it. So that's what the PIA will do. You will identify what data you're collecting and how you're using that data and the, and the reasons why you're using it. Then you plug this information into your policy. Um, I, I, I think that would more or less, for me, that's, the, that's my own, <laughs> how do you call that? my own uh, summary of what, uh, what a, uh, a PIA would contain. Yeah, there's, there was a question, uh, uh, is a PIA required? No, no. One of the things I'll tell you is that every time there's been a, a hearing in front of the NPC uh, or there's a breach or a violation, that's one of the, usually one of the first things the NPC will ask, can you show mm -hmm. us your PIA? So, you know, rather than show up there and say, we haven't done one, because once you say we haven't done a PAA, th that's already a, a, a warning sign, right? Mm -hmm. um, but more specifically, you know, if you look at, uh, let's see, it's in the IRR, you know, in the IRR, section 29 of the IRR, it says here that uh, you, should, you should know what are the risks posed by the processing. Know, what is the best practice and what is the cost of security implementation? So the question you'll be asked is, what, where did you document the risks of this process you know, based on IRR section 29? And if you can whip out your PIA, then definitely that's a, a point, you know, in, in a plus point for you. Right. You know, in relation to that, uh, I think there's a, there was a question here about what about you know the data that is collected every time you enter a building? Uh, if you were managing that process and that's a process mm -hmm. within your company, would you consider that to be a high risk uh, collection and processing uh, process, or would you say that that's oh, uh, lower risk? Yeah, they've seen so many uh, horror stories of that, right? You, you, you go into the building and then you. <laughs> No, actually, it's a, it's it's in fact it's a breach drill, no, that that uh, some companies have done. Right. You go back the next day and you you ask the security guard, oh, I left ID, where is it? And then you see where they kept it, right? Did they secure it? No, was it just left somewhere? And then you can, uh, like I said, told you earlier, no, at one time it was actually a security guard that was the whistleblower. Because that security guard felt they weren't protecting it, but uh -huh. even more, even more fun, is this this type of breach drill. You know, you go there, and then you get someone who looks like you to claim the ID for you. Then one hour later, you go and say, "Ah, oh, I left my ID." And then the guard says, "Oh, me kumuha na ho eh." Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Of course, it's all a drill because you want to see how they're gonna react. Is he gonna, you know, pull pull an uh, alarm bell? You know, are they going to start looking at the CCTV, etc.? But you, you may laugh, but these are actual situations, no? Uh, I've seen this happen in other buildings where they'll say, "Oh, yung ano yung kaopisina mo sabi nila pinakuha mo daw yung ID." You know, in other words, you know, someone said that you 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 they they could claim it for you, and then your your driver's license, no, or your national ID is gone. And and of course it's a hassle to have it replaced, and there's right, the risk right. of identity theft, right? Yeah. 
Well, that's an interesting uh, uh, exercise. I mean, you could you could uh, theoretically send uh, an anonymous email to a uh, COP, for example, or somebody in HR and say that all your data is now being shared on the dark web just to see if the COP will push it up to the, to the DPO uh, as a potential breach. And how long will right? it take? And how long, and how long it will take? Exactly, right? exactly. Yeah. Will, they, you know, will they sit yeah. on this? And, uh, so that's an interesting, uh, interesting, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a question here about law. No. Sorry, no, just, uh, one more question. No. One more question. No, this is outside the code of ethics for lawyers. Should law firms have their own privacy policy regarding the data they collect from clients? I'll let you handle that, JK. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is yes. Uh, yeah, there course, should be. Yeah. In fact, uh, my, my, uh, our firm, we do have a, a privacy policy. And uh, I mean, so it's two, on two levels, right? I mean, the thing about client information is, uh, is actually privileged uh, information. Uh, and that's actually, in, in many cases, it's even inadmissible. Uh, we're, and of course, lawyers are bound by confidentiality obligations, but the National Privacy Commission will require lawyers to have, uh, uh, and law firms to have uh, data privacy policies and consent forms and demonstrate compliance. Sure. Okay, go ahead, Dondi. I'm sorry. Sige. So now, when we did the PIA, the result of your privacy impact assessment is to tell you what risks you know, there are in that process. And this is why risk appetite is important. No? And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a one sentence description, which I will then explain on the next slide. Risk appetite is the ability to accept the difference between risk exposure and your capacity to manage risk, right? So are you willing to accept that difference? And I'll give you the example now. Here is a nice juicy burger, right? Uh, so many calories, right? And if you're gonna eat it, you know what? That you're at the risk of indigestion, right? But some people are willing to take that risk. You know, like this guy here, his capacity to digest that, he's confident of his capacity, right? So he says, yes, I'm gonna eat that. But this other guy comes up and he's wondering, kaya ko bayan? Can I actually, you know, finish that, you know, without running the risk of indigestion? But he says, ah, but my appetite is big. So you get the point, right? So even if there's a difference between the risk and your capacity, your appetite can make up the difference. And so companies that have a high appetite for risk are willing to take on these risky processes. Whereas usually regulated companies uh, that aren't, are, are allergic to risk could say, no, unless we are confident of our capacity to manage that risk, then we will shy away because our risk appetite is zero, right? Whereas other companies will say our risk appetite is one or two or three, okay? Now, just because your capacity to handle risk is low, does that mean you'll have to walk away from a lot of these risky processes? Not necessarily, right? Because there are always ways to increase your risk management capacity. So, for example, you're not sure whether you can handle the risk you know, of the process that you're now considering. One way to increase your cap capability is to bring in reinforcements. Now you can say, I'm uh, at the national level, I can bring in someone from the regional level. And so uh, as the regional DPO, that's what I'm prepared to do. You know? I'm prepared to help out sometimes you know, at these different countries. Of course, uh, as regional DPO, you also have to make sure that you're aware of your resources because at some point, you know, you, you might uh, be, be running out and, and you can't help th those, th those countries that need uh, additional help. So it's also a, a good idea to think of another way, which is to bring in outsources or service providers, right? And so here we often say that you share, you can share the risk with them, but you don't transfer the risk. Now, of course, this comes at an additional cost. Uh, and, and so you have to also assess the additional risk of transferring your data to that third party or to that service provider. So these are what we call the second order risks. You did your first risk assessment, you're bringing in a service provider, you now have to assess the addi additional risk. You know? And so oftentimes the answer to increasing capability is investing in yourself, right? Building your own capabilities so that you can handle those risks. 
And uh, this could mean additional training for your staff, uh, additional certification, uh, investing in new technology, new software, and also your staff uh, can now take advantage of what we call these privacy enhancing technologies or PETs. Uh, it can be something as simple as redesigning a form, redesigning a screen or a report, right? So that your, your uh, risk expo exposure is lowered. Okay, so just wanted to uh, very quickly go over that uh, concept you know, of, of risk, risk management, risk appetite. But very quickly also, let me go on to the next slide, which says, these are often times where you have board confrontations or disagreements. Because remember the picture we had earlier, the process owner, the COP, the DPO, they will oftentimes have these disagreements. The process owner will say it's low risk. The DPO will say it's high risk, right? And so there's a disagreement on what exactly our risk exposure is. Or there's a disagreement on capability to manage risk, right? The COP will say, kaya namin yan, we can manage that risk. The DPO will say, no, I don't think you're able to manage that risk. And so, you know, even if they work this out, uh, you know, the final question when you when you get to the board or to the uh, MANCOM executive committee is, so how much do you need? If we're going to invest in service providers, right, outsourcing, if we're going to invest in capabilities to bring up your uh, ability to manage that risk, how much will it cost? So uh, oftentimes these are where you have uh, those types of, of discussions. No? Now, some of my tips here, uh, when you talk about risk exposure, this is where it helps to, ha to have a discipline, a risk management discipline. Uh, some of you may even have heard of ISO uh, 31000. No? It, it's a whole book that talks about different types of risk. But just to simplify it, you know, for example, Example, in, in your organization, you might talk about compliance risk, financial risk, right? market risk, reputational risk, operational risk, environmental risk, right? So these are the types of uh, dimensions of risk. And you may have one, two, or three, but the, the, the idea is to have a taxonomy. So when you talk about risks, you, you agree with each other, right? Then remember the risk appetite. You can even have a different risk appetite for each one. Like we have a, a, a healthy appetite for financial risk, but we have zero appetite for compliance risk. You know, that might be an example of how you talk. And last but not least, when you talk about risk, you oftentimes have an X, Y matrix. You know? And if you look at the, the documentation from the NPC, if you look at the uh, exhibits attached in the back, they all have an example of a four by four matrix where you rate on one axis the impact of the exposure and on another axis the likelihood or probability. And you, you, this comes up, this results in a four by four matrix where you can now easily say, you know, ito malala, mataas yung impact pero low probability. Or something that's high impact and high probability and obviously that would be, you know, high risk. So by having these tools, by having these terminologies, it reduces the, the disagreements that you have over risk exposure. Because that's one of the, the, the hardest things to resolve. No? If the process owner says, oh, low risk at all, but the DPO says high risk, now how do you get them to an agreement? Okay. So, so that's, that's one area you need to manage. The other one is the investment. No? And, and, you know, oftentimes you go to the board, you say, I need 100,000 pesos to do this. You know, and the process owner and the DPO both agree that it's 100,000. Then the board says, we can only give you 50,000. What do you do? You know, and so here it helps to do what's called uh, scenario planning. You know, what if you're only given 50,000? What, what can you do? What if you have more? What can you do with it? You know, what if you have this much? What can you do with it? Right? So at least you're prepared for scenario A, A B, or C. Uh, the one that uh, the one in the middle that talks about uh, capability to manage risk. Uh, this one can also get major sensitive, pangajan, you know, because someone will say kaya ko yan, and then you have to come back and say hindi, hindi mo kaya yan, no? Yung kakayahan niya, yung kapabilidad niya, no, na gawin yung proseso na yon. So uh, 
the best way to resolve this for me is to look at uh, industry benchmarks or standards. So I think I mentioned a couple already earlier, right? Um, the question really here is, uh, you know, here's a scorecard that was developed by the industry. In the case of ISO, um, many private sector organizations, you know, uh, developed that. In the case of the CBPR, cross-border privacy rules, the APEC members that came together and, and and here you would be asked to answer certain questions. Now, again, again, rate yourself. Now, are you really keeping track of all the technologies out there to see you know, what the exposure each one can give you? Do you have uh, a good idea of where your data is? Now, have you mapped it? And do you have an inventory of where it's located? Do you have uh, procedures in place for cross-border transfers? Now, do you have... Uh, incident reporting and breach management processes in place. Do you know how many of your employees are trained? No, and how often do they have a refresher? When was the last time you did an audit? When was the last time you did a vulnerability assessment? When was the last time you did a drill? No, and these benchmarks allow you to rate yourself against you know, how the, the, the rest of the industry is doing. So when it comes time to kaya ba natin yan o hindi natin kaya, there's an objective way of measuring that, right? So at least you can you can point to these checklists. You don't necessarily have to get the seal of approval no? because people ask, magkano ba yan? No? It's expensive to get an ISO stamp, right? It's there on your logo, it's there in your letterhead, etc. But even without getting that stamp of approval, just to use the checklist, to do an internal self-assessment is already oftentimes a useful exercise. No? But once you've done this, once you've done all of it, of course, why not? Why not get that, that ribbon? And why not get that, that seal? Because uh, as, as we mentioned at the beginning of the session, how will people know that you can be trusted? You know, how will the uh, data subjects know that they can give the data to you? Uh, and one way is by having these certifications, you know, whether it be from ISO or APEC or, you know, what what other uh, uh, organizations you know, would be giving this. So, Siga, let me pause there because you know, I've talked a bit about, you know, risk appetite and board uh, confrontations. And let's see, you know, if there are questions at this point. There's so many questions. <laughs> I don't yeah. even know where to begin. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a question here about... Um, if uh, data received by a company which is not data privacy compliant, uh, is it admissible as evidence? Uh, can you subpoena, can HR uh, be subpoenaed to produce documents during a trial? I think this, I mean, maybe I should answer this. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, yeah. So I think, I, I don't know if you will agree with me. Um, I think there's an exception under in the statute for, uh, um, for the use of personal information to defend uh, rights. Uh, so uh, court court proceedings uh, and of that nature, uh, you, are, you are able to use uh, personal information. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, the more relevant that personal information is to the case. So for example, you're defending yourself in an illegal termination case and the evidence is with the HR, obviously, uh, I think it would be reasonable to say that uh, you're entitled to, to that personal information. Uh, let me see. Yeah, section There's a con yeah. for use uh, in, in defense yeah, in a court proceeding. Oh, here's a, here's a thorny question for you yeah. uh, from Jay Gachalian. In the event of a conflict in policy between the privacy team and business, whose decision prevails? Is it just a matter of finding common ground to align the two? Question. Yeah, that's tough, no? Because, uh, uh, okay, <laughs> this reminds me of an interview question, you know, uh, oftentimes the DPO will be asked, right, uh, will you do it if it's legal, but it's immoral? Because taken to an extreme, that's what that question is asking, right? It's legal, eh? Or pasado naman yan sa batas, eh? But is it moral? No? So, but, and of course, I don't ask a lawyer that question. <laughs> <laughs> you might not like the answer. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. Oh. So, uh, there's, a, there's a practical yeah. question here. Do we need to conduct PIAs annually, even ah, if there's okay. no change in process? Yeah, yeah. Very, very nice question. 
You know, the, the typical answer there is it depends on how fast moving your industry is. You know? Usually uh, regulated industries, uh, the processes, the technology that doesn't change that often. But uh, FinTech, which is quite fast moving, uh, you may want to do a PAA uh, quite often you know, because you're uh, re releasing new versions of the tool, etc. cetera. You know? But regardless of whether you're fast or slow moving, there's also something happening outside. And I'll give you an example of this, the Comelec breach, 55 million records. You know? If I did a PIA before the Comelec breach, and, it, and, and, and my conclusion there is, what I'm doing is low risk, because anyway, the data cannot be re-identified. As a result of the Comelec breach, the Comelec, suddenly there's a higher risk to the data subjects, even my data subjects, because the data that's been leaked you know, to the world will now allow my process will has now made my process more vulnerable and i'll tell you so many credit card companies had to redo their pia remember because uh what did the comelec database contain those were the data that oftentimes you know the credit card uh, agent would ask you over the phone and now it's out into the public so even without changing your process you're you have now become vulnerable your, imp your risk has now increased because of an external event happening called the Comelec. Right. You know, one of the, so the data that they got there was really, uh, I mean, unbelievable, right? Uh, the amount of data that was uh, uh, gathered or made uh, disclosed. Uh, enough data to, to make an ID because you have the address. You even have the names of the rel people related to that person. Uh, and so, but when one of the things that uh, I've been curious about is how much of that data was actually used, because it doesn't seem to me that, or at least I haven't seen, I'm not sure if you've seen this, I've not seen massive identity theft uh, occurring uh, after uh, uh, comedy. Um, in another country, it might be more massive. Yeah, so maybe, yeah. maybe that's something to be thankful for. There's something... Uh, that there's something to be said about maybe the diligence of the banking industry that there's not been enough uh, or more instances of identity theft. Sure. But I wouldn't put it past uh, anyone to, to have used some of those identities to create uh, Facebook accounts, for example, right? Because as you say, uh, in the banking sector, there's a higher uh, degree of vigilance, but in some others, you know, maybe in social media, some of the data could have been used to create a lot of these uh, fake accounts no? that's true no because there were a lot of uh, a lot of them came out uh, recently uh, there's a question here regarding uh, training institutions on uh, dpo certification uh it's from somebody you know <laughs> this is from, from rolando <laughs> lansigan oh, yeah. uh, do hey, you Rolly. how do you assess the delivery of <laughs> training institutions on dpo certification are they meeting the requirements of npc in terms of compliance or do you think there's an evaluation there should be an evaluation of these uh, training programs. Yeah, I, I think uh, as a minimum, no, and I would say this to everyone in the audience, please, no, when you uh, attend the training session, find out also what are the certification of your instructor, right? Because uh, as you say, we don't want to have a situation where it's the blind leading the blind, right? So uh, for me, that would at least be something that you want to find out no, is, uh, you know, whoever that instructor is that's delivering, you know, where were they trained? What certifications do they have? What's their uh, background? You know? Because uh, there are some nuances, you know, and, and th this, this law is extremely nuanced. You know? In fact, that's the, that's the frustration of software engineers. You know? When we, you work with people in IT, it's always yes or no, black or white, a one or a zero. You know, but then when you when you ask someone from the privacy side, is this personal data? And the answer is, it depends. <laughs> what are the other fields? You know, <laughs> is this allowed? It depends. Depends. You know, on what the purpose is, right? And so on. And so, it it helps to have uh, an instructor that can show you all of these different examples, and assess. You know, in this particular situation, it would be allowed. In this one, it would not be allowed. You know, because, uh, and, and, and that's why I, I would often say, uh, 
uh, if you want to take a course, if you're really serious in taking a course no, to, to uh, entry level course no, for a DPO, invest in, in the time. No? Uh, in other countries, when, when they have this thing called the CIPP, the Certified Information Privacy Professional, it's at least uh, two days, no? 16 hours. Wala pang kulong yon, di ba? Di sa ibang bansa. So I right. think in the Philippines, maybe it, it you should at least spend more than two days, no, to to really understand all of the nuances, no, of this law. Right, right. Here's a here's some a nuanced question. Yeah. Um, uh, on the implementation of the Freedom of Information Executive Order, mm. how can a public office manage the limitations? you know, the balance between issuing public documents and of protecting uh, privacy rights? Because I think there's a lot of anxiety uh, with respect to yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Actually, madali lang yan. No? That's in Section 4 of the IRR as well as the uh, Data Privacy Act. No, it, it it clearly states the scope. Now, in other words, ano ba yung sakop ng Data Privacy Act? Ano yung hindi sakop? At saka, and yung hindi sakop, no, those that are out of scope, will of course fall under the FOI. And and primarily I think the uh, the key point got there was anything that allows you to gain an economic benefit, you know, from government, uh, that should not fall under the purview of uh, of the DPA, DPA, especially if there was discretionary. You know. Uh, but yeah this is this is really for me uh, something that hits at the heart of our deadlines, our headlines today, you know, because the field health uh, benefits. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Should uh, be something that falls under FOI, correct? I mean, uh, because hmm. tayo, tayo rin nagbayad noon as taxpayers, as field health members, no? And we want to know where is it going, no? And therefore, FOI, no? It should really be the operative uh, rule there. No? Okay, so, wow, this is a very difficult question. Uh, from a business standpoint, Beth Terrace asks, um, can be denied that data is uh, important in growing businesses. It's the new oil. That said, how can we make use of data to grow business in terms of uh, product service innovation, marketing strategy, and so on, but oh. still operate within compliance limits? Yeah, I think this is where... Uh we now start to look at a field called data ethics you know? mm. and uh, it's important to understand the ethical side of it because uh, every, everything will be revealed at some point no uh, th there's a bank in the uk that's being investigated now by the uk regulator for how it was using the data of its employees right and so lalabas rin yan ang lalabas eh? and so right. You, you might benefit from the data. You might say, hey, it helped me grow last quarter, you know, and the quarter before that. But then when it comes out that you're doing something unethical, all those gains will be lost. You know? So you always want to make sure that what you do is sustainable. You know? It's systemically responsible. Uh, in other words, it's moral and it's ethical. You know? Because otherwise... I like the way you answer that. Everything. <laughs> yeah. In fact, uh, you said earlier the golden rule. Yeah. And I think... Uh, yeah. Sometimes uh, there's a tendency uh, for people in data privacy to sometimes lose, you know, it's like the forest for the trees. Eh? You're, you're confronted with the compliance challenge in front of you and, uh, and uh, the challenges of the business, right? Wanting to use the data. But if you just stop and think, is this going to harm the data subject? Then that might, you know, it's sort of a, a better compass, I think, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, there was, there was a social media company that was collecting cell phone numbers, mobile numbers, right? And it says on their data privacy notice, we need this to contact you, right? In, in, in order to for you to uh, authenticate, right? If you're logging on from a new device. But then uh, at some point, it, and they started using it for something else, right? As an, part of the advertising, uh, you, you know, framework, so mm -hmm. that they could now use it to connect you with other things that you were doing. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, for a short while, they were able to use that to create uh, new revenues. 
but then eventually it came out no and so people lost their faith and trust in that company right and uh, i think one of the <laughs> the slides that i you know the, the sayings that i also always mention is that privacy has now become the proxy for trust you know if you can't protect my data, if you can't respect my privacy, why should I trust you? And by the way, nowadays, bawal na yung magkamay. No? Kaya yung shaking hands dyan, naka-yellow box. <laughs> ano, elbow na lang. <laughs> elbow bump na lang gano'n. Uh, sign of the times, eh, no? <laughs> yeah. 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 But if you, can, if you can show that you're serious about privacy, then you gain the trust, you know, of the customers. So, and once you have their trust, yes, they will do more business with you. I think that's I think that's true. I get the sense that uh, uh, so the but but people, so for the things that are important to people, uh, if if privacy is important in a certain context, it, they might choose a provide this provider over another provider. Certainly, Apple is playing to that to that strategy mm -hmm. uh, by providing more security or more uh, privacy protection. They've been very explicit about that. Uh, but it's it, it's really interesting to see that in the context of say social media because uh, I don't see a lot of people leaving Facebook uh, despite the fact that we have a um, somewhat complicated relationship with Facebook when it comes to personal information. But so my I sense that sense that I get is that people understand that they have to give up a bit of privacy for the benefits of the service that they're that they're using, and I think in in uh, Facebook and in other social media platforms they. They find that that balance. Uh, Filipinos uh, also, in particular, I think. What do you think? Yeah, I think I've, a lot of people uh, I know are using it less. Uh, more people are using uh, some other platforms, uh, LinkedIn, mm. uh, maybe TikTok. <laughs> <you know>? <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, uh, it's interesting. So there's a see. there's an interesting situation here. There's a doctor. Uh, and uh, apparently had some marital problems, and his wife uh, uh, ransacked his office uh, and able to uh, get clinical information on his patients. Oh. Uh, he's asking, were his privacy rights violated? Or, or can he assert his client's privacy rights? Uh, that's an interesting question. In, the, in other words, he will assert it in behalf of his clients. Uh, at the NPC, the it was always important to have the data subject represented. No? So I would remember that, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and in fact, in the Circular 16-04, Rules of Procedure, it says there that if you are not the data subject, then uh, an advisory opinion could be issued, but not a compliance order or a finding. No? Well, anyway. I think, yeah, yeah, but I think in a sense, because he's the controller, uh, he can, uh, he can uh, assert that he is uh, exercising his, uh, his uh, responsibility as a data privacy controller to seize the data, right, to protect the data. But you're right. I think one of the other issues would be, is that a data breach and do you need to report that to the, to the, um, the National Privacy Commission, but also to, the, to your, to your uh, patients? that their personal information, sensitive personal information that's been, uh, um, what's that, exfiltrated, right? Um, is a cell phone postpaid number, <laughs> is this covered by data privacy app? Maybe that's, we'll split that question into two. One is yeah. postpaid, the other one is prepaid. So postpaid personal information? It, it, oh, okay, actually there is an advisory opinion no, that answers that. No? Mm -hmm. And uh, while well, I was no longer with the NPC at that time, yeah, that, that's actually a good discussion because uh, the question always is, is it a person using that number or did you put that SIM card into a machine, right, which is now mm -hmm. sending out SMS numbers at random? Or in fact, maybe you, you've assigned it to a motor pool, you know, and then whoever is handling a, per certain, a particular truck Right. In other words, the SIM card oh, is that's right. to the truck. So whoever is driving that truck. So, I mean, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect, which is a bit worrisome, and JJ, I, I hope you know you can uh, uh, still advocate in, in front of the Congress, right? For this is, they're they're now considering 
uh, financial information, right? Now, think about this. Whether it's postpaid or prepaid, once you start loading uh, digital currency right. by using that SIM card, that now becomes financial information as defined under the current proposed amendments, which means that it becomes SPI. So Sensitive. that's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Actually, my concern about that part because so Congress wants to include uh, personal, uh, sorry, financial information as sensitive. My concern is that a lot of financial information is necessary for uh, financial institutions and fintechs and banks to assess your credit risk, right? So having that information available in the system allows them to be more efficient. Uh, so I, I'm concerned that uh, when they turn it into sensitive personal information, somebody who's not good at paying his debts cannot give consent, right? Refuse to give consent oh, well. and therefore shield, right? The banks However, from... Uh, uh, again, I remember that uh, th there is in the scope section of of the law and the IRR mm -hmm. information needed for the credit information systems uh, CISA is mm -hmm. uh, out of is out of scope. And so uh, the CIC can still ask for that information because of that exemption granted. There are two there are two uh, laws now where that information is exempt: the Anti Money right. Laundering Act and the Credit Information Act. That's correct, it's mentioned, that's right, that's right. Uh, but still, I mean, uh, I think that will be, that's going to be, you know, a, uh, what do you call that? A battleground, right? Because uh, somebody might say, well, we're not, we're not an, an institution covered. So Matelco might claim, we're not sure. a reporting yeah. institution yeah. under the CIC. So then you have this situation, right? And then FinTechs love to use this, all this information. So, uh, again, uh, I, I, that's why I'm, I think you're right. There, there's some reason to be concerned about. You know, obviously, the NPC is being, being very protective. And sometimes I think uh, overly so. But that's why there's a conversation uh, in the technical working group. Uh, we're trying to find... Uh, everybody in the is, wants to is really um, uh, sort of focus on protecting people. Yeah, I think it's just yeah. a matter of sometimes drawing the line in a way that it's reasonable because you don't want to spend your life... I, think for, I, I mean, I... I I uh, sympathize with a lot of big companies that have to spend so much money on compliance whenever you move the line, right? So one phrase in the law and suddenly you're spending millions in compliance. And, but it, and it has to have some sort of reasonable basis. I think that's the important part. Okay. Um, I thought, oh, sorry, this is interesting. It's our mandate to conduct research and provide training. This is, I think this is a medical, uh, medical, uh, uh, maybe a medical society, you know? so they conduct research or a doctor and they provide training. Do we still need to secure his consent if we will include uh, a patient in the conduct of research? Oh, definitely, you know, I think that even before that research project is kicked off, it has to go through an ethics board. You know? So uh, I, I would think that the ethics board would already have um, defined the parameters for, for gathering that data. Uh, in fact, if you go to PGH, that, that's quite uh, noticeable no? that the, the consent is different from if you go to some other hospital, right? So uh, th there's also a, a very interesting discussion now going on in front of the German regulator, which is in order to anonymize someone's data, and anonymization is actually processing because you've taken the right. data and you therefore need consent to anonymize someone's data. That's a, that's an interesting that's an interesting point uh, because you're right. Technically, anony anonymization is a processing activity. I would have thought though, like deletion, deletion of data is a processing of data. And should you should you have consent? I I I have taken a one one of my views about that is when I delete your data or when I anonymize your data, I am protecting your privacy because then that data can no longer be either accessed if I deleted it, or second, it can no longer be linked to you. So I have protected your privacy. Uh, 
I think the, the question might be on how well you anonymize the data. Yeah. Because I think there have been yeah, yeah. famous instances where the anonymization was done so badly, people were able to de-anonymize and therefore then in, <laughs> violate the privacy of the data subject. That's one of the risks though. And then another right. risk is uh, when it goes, comes to something called the social impact assessment, where certain segments of society will therefore uh, be lumped together, and, and this is what Cambridge Analytica did, right? Mm. Uh, then uh, it actually impacts the entire segment of, you know, you can imagine, for example, uh, my cohort that went to high school, right? So, uh, you know, so males of males of a certain age uh, would suddenly have all, all, all of this data, even if we did not consent to it being anonymized, uh, that data will still be used to target, do targeted profiling, you know? Uh, so that's why they say that the data is the new carbon dioxide, right? So uh, I, I don't think we have time to go into this, but do a search. You know, it's on the internet. You, you, you type in data is the new carbon dioxide uh, and, and you'll see how, you know, the, the data that you give, even if you give it an, with consent, can harm other people. Uh, <laughs> So it's that's very, what happened with oil, right? You said earlier that uh, yeah. uh, data is the new oil, and that's what happened with oil. We released it, we used it, and we uh, created uh, uh, yeah. pollution yeah. and global warming. Yeah. It's car no, then, carbon monoxide, Paladi. Well, carbon monoxide. monoxide. Yeah. Right, right. Carbon dioxide, so, we breathe it all the time, yeah, but that's right. It's the one from coming from the cars, no? carbon monoxide. Yeah. Right, right. So it's one of sort of uh, the... the uh, by by using uh, data commercially, there's all these unintended consequences. Yeah. Uh, and you know, and, and I think one of the biggest uh, challenges really for for data privacy law is uh, we believe right now, right, the way the law is structured, that people have the ability to give consent, right? And once you give consent, then you know you've given all your consent, and therefore the data. Can be used, and you have to ask that question whether really people are really giving informed consent. Because I think a lot of people, you know, it's either small print or they don't have time. It's twenty pages long. So the, the infographics question earlier, I think, was relevant because I think if people have a better sense, uh, then they can protect themselves. But moving forward, I think maybe one of the solutions is I hope there will be an industry called data brokers who I will choose a data broker who fits my, you know, a profile and will protect my data that, say, that, that way. And I'll say, okay, you protect my personal information that way. You, you give consent in my behalf. I wonder if that's possible, you know, rather than leaving all of this data in, in different places. Well, and that's what and, we're doing now. Yeah, yeah of course, uh, India, right, is coming up with, uh, I think, the latest experiment on that. They're going to create an agency for non-personal data, uh, which is basically personal data that you've uh, anonymized. No? Okay, so uh, we have uh, we have a minute or two. Uh, would you like to uh, have any closing statements, Dante? Yeah, I think uh, I'd like to encourage everyone really, you know, to uh, consider, you know, uh, a profession here in the privacy industry as a data protection officer or as a privacy engineer, right? And uh, I know that we've had quite limited time, but then I've given you my social media. It's it's on the screen. Um, it's under Damian Mapa in LinkedIn. And please feel free to connect and uh, we can continue the dialogue there. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Don D. Um, let me see if I can uh, stop your sharing here. Um, so uh, thank you, Dondi. Uh, that was a great session where we discussed a lot about uh, uh, data privacy and, uh, of course, uh, the, the concerns uh, about this topic. And you've given us a lot of information, a lot of things to, to think about. We're grateful for your for your participation. Uh, I guess that that gives us uh, close as another session of uh, uh, Digital Transformation Thursdays. Uh, next week uh, we will be discussing uh, copyright in the digital domain. Um, one more thing, and this is a question that everyone has been asking, do you, can you get a certificate of participation? And we were, there was an internal discussion about this. And what we've decided was we will issue certificates of participation or certificates of attendance for a fee 
which we will then turn around and uh, we will donate that uh, in your name to uh, to uh, uh, COVID related either one of these uh, COVID um, what's the word uh, hospitals government hospitals to to support uh, our frontliners. That's how that's how the way we decided uh, to to help out. Um, it's been uh, it's been a challenging time for everyone, and we feel that it would be it would be uh, best if uh, we can uh, provide that for our uh, frontliners. Um, on that on that note, again, uh, I'd like to thank you for for attending, uh, and uh, we'd like to uh, again thank uh, Don B. Uh, we hope to see you next week at uh, at uh, Digital Transformation Thursday. Thank you. All right, thanks and bye everyone.